afternoon, good evening. My name is Anakshi Sopti. A warm welcome to all of you who have tuned in from across the world. From India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, some from the Middle East, the US, from Europe, Africa, Australia. We hope you and your families are safe and well. On behalf of the Harvard Business School India Research Center and our faculty here in Boston, our esteemed colleagues from Harvard Business Publishing and our panelists, thank you for joining us. Welcome to this conversation on Accelerating Digital in our webinar series, Leadership Perspectives for a Changing World. With most of us transitioning into online work, schools, universities, and our children adapting to online teaching, and businesses reinventing processes to stay engaged and to survive. COVID-19 has clearly precipitated the need to accelerate digital. Competitive advantage will accrue to companies and governments that are agile and those that adapt to making data-driven analytics and digital a core part of their growth strategy. Today, we have a step Hello, panel of faculty and industry leaders sharing their experiences, their expertise, and thoughts on the topic. These are surreal, historical, and challenging times. We do hope our series of conversations pre uh, present relevant research, potential frameworks, and solutions that are useful as you navigate the space. And with that, I'd like to welcome Adi Ignatius, Chief Editor of the Harvard Business Review to set the context and lead the discussion. Thank you very much, Inakshi. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here um, in front of this audience. The topic is accelerating digital. You know, I understand on one level that seems like an old message that of course we're digital. We've been talking about being digital for years and years. And the fact is, as I talk to companies, uh, big companies, small companies, American companies, international companies, becoming truly digital, um, truly adopting a, a digital mindset remains a number one challenge um, in terms of the products, the processes, um, talent development. So we're gonna try to, to go deep on this topic today. And um, we're gonna kick this off uh, with the keynote delivery from Professor Kareem Lakhani of Harvard Business School. Um, who I'll now introduce. Professor Lakani is one of the school's top experts on technology, on AI, and on digital transformation. He's the founder and co-director of the Laboratory for Innovation Science at Harvard, and is a prolific author of articles for both an academic and practitioner audience. He's co-written several major uh, pieces for Harvard Business View, Review in recent years, including Using the Crowd as an Innovation Partner, The Truth About Blockchain, and competing in the age of AI. That last article grew into a book co-written with Marco Iancidi called Competing in the Age of AI, Strategy and Leadership When Algorithms and Networks Rule the World, proudly published by Harvard Business Review Press. So with that, I wanna hand it over to Professor Kareem Lakani. Thanks very much, Adi. Uh, real pleasure to have everybody with you. Um, you know, it's unbelievable that we have, you know, over 2,000 attendees right now on the, on the, on the, on the webinar. Uh, and this simply would not have been possible uh, before, right? There's no auditorium at Harvard right now that can accommodate 2,000 people for a webinar and to actually have people from around the world uh, participate. And so this is part of the digital revolution that we're living in, that all of us are learning to interact uh, and work with each other in very different circumstances, very terrible circumstances in, in many ways, but also showing some, um, some amazing uh, glimmers of hope. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share with you a, a brief presentation around the book that I wrote with Marco. Um, and then, you know, we're well, looking forward to learning from all of our esteemed panelists as well uh, to see, uh, you know, how we make of, of, of what's happening in this world. And, uh, you know, the title of this presentation is Competing in the Age of AI, but also in the age of COVID because, this is a global shock, just as we argue in the book that AI is a global shock to the economy. COVID also is a global shock. And you'll see, I'll try to draw parallels between what's happening in the AI world, but also with the, in the world of COVID. Um, 
So the first thing, of course, is for us to have a clear definition of AI. When people think about AI of artificial intelligence, their minds typically go to what's known as strong AI in computer science. They think about it as, you know, the Star Trek computers, the Star Wars computers, science fiction things, you know, machines that can think and act in a way that matches or sur surpasses human intelligence. That's known as strong AI. But the reality is that uh, most of the AI systems that we see deployed around the world that we use every day from image recognition to voice translation uh, to payments is performed by weak AI, uh, which is basically any activity computers are able to perform that humans once performed. And weak AI is basically a set of very dedicated, very narrow algorithms that do one thing and do one thing really well. And that then can be expanded into many different things put together. But the one thing that it does really well doesn't actually translate to other settings. And that's known as weak AI. And part of our, our argument in the book is that we don't have to wait for strong AI to make a difference in the world of business. Weak AI is enough to get the ball rolling and in fact have dramatic effects. So let me start with a couple, couple of cute examples. <clears throat> uh, first one comes from China. This is from JD Digits. Uh, the Chinese government asked JD Digits to actually start to offer financial products to their farmers. And they said, well, we, we want to do livestock counting because we want to be able to count how many pigs or, 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 or other farm animals that, uh, that, uh, uh, that a farmer has and uniquely identify them. So what they started with was a, was a program to do, uh, you know, man, uh, facial recognition for pigs, because not only do you need to know how many pigs does a farmer have, but also which pigs are actually insured in this case in China. So they took off the shelf algorithms for facial recognition that are, that is used for humans and applied it to the setting of, uh, of, of livestock. And then <clears throat> very quickly, they were able to come up with unique identifiers for their livestock, but then also count them, keep, keep track of their health and so on and so forth. Now, the thing to note is that JD Digits is not going to get rich selling facial recognition software for, for livestock, right? That's not going to be their business. Their business is to actually offer insurance schemes for farmers and create a platform that allows farmers to now keep track of the health of their livestock, make sure that they can get the best prices for the livestock when they're ready for slaughter, and so on and so forth. And so the idea here is that a, a very narrow application of AI can then open up a whole new range of business models, opportunities for, for example, uh, uh, in the, in the farmer's, uh, farmer sector as well. Another example of this is something that our, our lab did at Harvard. This is in collaboration with our colleagues at the medical school, where we use crowdsourcing actually to develop an AI-based solution for radiation therapy targeting. In this case, what happened is that we wanted to be able to reduce the time radiation therapists spent outlining tumors that people get in their lungs or across their body. It's a very time intensive activity. And we ran basically an open source uh, contest uh, in the world where everybody could participate. Um, and then within eight weeks and about spending about $50,000, we got two things. One is that our software was, was as good as a Harvard-trained radiation oncologist in outlining tumors, uh, but also it was better than any commercial software that was available. And the surprising thing here was that this software got derived by people that took code from autonomous driving software and applied it to the healthcare setting. Again, weak AI narrowly defined being applied here for us. The other thing to note is that, you know, I'm a co-author on this paper that came out in JAM Oncology. But the last time I took biology was in 10th grade. I think I got a, like a C in the class. I was never a star student in biology. But what it tells you is that the cost of our ability to get algorithms to go after tough problems have dropped dramatically. So even a person like me at a business school cannot be publishing in a science journal like JAMA going forward. So now let's imagine all this weak AI being deployed at scale. And what does that look like? So I think um, a, a quintessential example that we have in our book is a company out of China and financial, uh, which has basically deployed AI at scale across the enterprise. And they've gone from basically serving you know, millions of people to about 1.2 billion people worldwide. They've massively expanded the scope of things that they offer. And they are set up in a way that, for example, if you want a, a, a loan account with them, their, their process is 310 three minutes to apply, one second for approval, and zero human intervention, right? If you did the same thing for us here in the US, it would be weeks before you got a loan, 
right? But here they're set up in a way to be able to deploy AI at scale across the entire enterprise. And the amazing thing about this, this enterprise is that in order for them to, to serve 1.2 billion people, they have roughly about 15,000 employees, right? So 15,000 employees serving 1.2 billion people at scale. And AI is at the heart of the organization that they have set up. And when we start to think about a company like Ant Financial, we need to think about this in two distinct dimensions. The business model, how companies create value and how they capture value. And then the operating model, how they achieve scale. Um, lots of people can participate in their platform, how they offer many different things that's known as scope and how they learn and they keep improving. What we argue in the book is that AI is, is impacting both the business model as well as the operating model for most organizations. And what Ant does is that Ant uses AI to drive digital scale, scope, and learning, right? They create a multi-sided platform. You know, Paytm is also their partner. <clears throat> and they, they can basically draw increasing value at the center of their organization by having lots of interactions. But then the data across the entire organization enables them to massively incre increase scale, scope, and learning. And as Satya Nadella has said, AI is the new runtime that's going to shape all that we do. When you are at a scale like Ant with 1.2 billion people, you can't have human-centered processes driving value delivery. You actually need to automate the entire process and have humans at the edges designing and operating the algorithms, but the work is being done actually by the, by the machines themselves. And the logic of, of, of a company like Ant is to basically grab more and more data. The, the more data they get, the better algorithms they build, the better algorithms they have, they have the better service, the better service they have, the more usage, and so on and so forth. And at the core of Ant is what we call an AI factory. And we argue that everybody will need an AI factory inside of their organization. The AI factory basically uh, industrializes the data analytics operation that all companies now need. Today, data analytics uh, and AI and our ability to make, make decisions is actually driven mostly by spreadsheets, right? We call up our friends, say, send me this data, please, in your company. They might take a week or two. Then we have a spreadsheet. We sit there and we, we, we make some predictions about the future, and then we take some action. The AI factory basically industrializes this process. And what does the AI factory do? The AI factory makes predictions about some future state of your business in some particular activity. It does pattern recognition at scale, right? And it drives automation. And the AI factory, we argue in the book, is going to be the same regardless of the industry. Whether you be in healthcare, whether you be in manufacturing, whether you be in retail, the AI factory itself is going to be the same. Now, the garment factory for retail is going to look very different but the AI factory is going to look the same. And in many cases, look the same as what you know, Google has, what Facebook has, what PTM has, and what, um, what N Financial has as well. So how, do, how does this all come together? What we're seeing right now in the economy is a clash, is a collision, um, where we have a digital business model that basically generates increasing value over time as the number of users increases with both network effects and learning effects. And they're set up in a way where data is shared across the entire enterprise, right? Everything, all the applications are set up in a way that they, they serve across a common data set. And they're colliding with traditional product businesses that historically were set up as silos. We have different silos set up, right? And we have a silo for IT and data and the customers and our employees, and these silos don't talk to each other. And this collision is happening between this traditional product business with the fixed capacity, with the fixed value, with a digital business with increasing value. And this collision we see happening across the board in a range of industries. For example, in travel, in, in transportation, in banking, right? And even in the world of pharmaceuticals. Uh, this collision we see is the core of what defines an AI-centered firm versus a traditional product firm. But I want you to take a step back and think about these two curves that we are showing as collision. If I replace digital business and traditional product business with hospital capacity and the COVID generation process, it's the same thing going on, right? Most of the world underestimated, especially the US these days, underestimated how to think about exponential systems, right? COVID as a disease is an exponential system that sits flat for a while and then rapidly accelerates. 
this is the same same process that digital businesses have been doing to traditional product businesses. Marriott looked at Airbnb for a long time and said, not the right business, not the right business, not the right business. We don't care, we don't care, we, care, we don't care until the collision happened. And by the way, it's the same story with COVID, right? It's, it's flat, only four people have it, only five people have it. Nobody knows about it. It's flat, 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 and then all of a sudden it takes off. These are the exponential systems that we're seeing take over in the healthcare system, but it's the same set of processes that we now see happening um, uh, in, in digital businesses as well. So with COVID-19, digital transformation is no longer an option, right? What we've seen, uh, when I talk to leaders and the leaders that we have on our panel too, it's, it's accelerating digital transformation. In many ways, I think we're going to get winners and losers for those companies that adopt digital transformation with COVID versus those that don't. Um, and similarly, of course, we have, uh, 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 we're finally at a point where the models are becoming credible, right? And we know like wearing a mask, really good, good, important thing, right? You should all be wearing a mask when you're going outside until this disease with a vaccine is, is, has been solved for. Um, but of course, there's uncertainty, right? And when it comes to making our predictions uh, and, we, and that requires us to have a loss of agility. And so our belief is that COVID is gonna be the ultimate driver of digital transformation. You know, I've spoken to executives that said, you know, we were in committees and governance meetings about this or that, you know, should customers buy online or not? Should we link our online stores with our offline experiences and so on and so forth? All that became uh, irrelevant, right? And in two weeks, two years worth of digital transformation got done. Um, some very interesting examples uh, for me to share with you. Uh, you know, this, this company is in the, is in the, in the news quite a bit, Moderna. Uh, they are uh, the first ever digital biotech. Uh, Stefan Benzel, the Moderna CEO says, we're a tech company that happens to do biology. The amazing thing about this company is that from the time that the virus was sequenced, to their ability to have a, a, a vaccine ready took them 42 days, okay? And they've built basically uh, with their technology of, of, of messenger RNA, a digital biotech that drives digital transformation across the entire enterprise. And the most interesting thing to me about Moderna was the fact that their chief digital officer is also their chief process excellence officer. So what Stefan Bensal and, 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 uh, and Marcelo Damiani have said, who's their chief digital officer said, is that we can't just digitize existing processes. We have to change the architecture of our organization to take advantage of what these digital technologies enable us to do. So from preclinical to R&D, all they do manufacturing, every single aspect of their process has been digitized, they have data, they have an AI factory that drives predictions and makes them do what they are now able to do along the way. Um, another great example, um, and we have Dr. Reddy here as well, so we'll, talk, we'll hear about what's been happening in, in, in Indian hospitals, but Mass General Hospital here in Boston, you know, a neighbor of ours, basically also rely tremendously on technology to, to, to enable us to cope here in Boston with the COVID crisis. Um, and I thought this, this particular uh, 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 quote from Dr. Kelly Whitbold is very instructive. I thought I would spend the next 10 years of my life trying to validate my career by hacking the totem poles of policymakers and insurance payers to convince them the value of digital health um, and telemedicine for care delivery innovation. COVID has done this for me in only a matter of weeks, right? Again, in telemedicine, we thought it was gonna happen, it's gonna happen, now fully accelerated. And how we use these technologies throughout our systems is gonna, again, gonna be very important for us. So look, opportunities uh, are uh, abound for us, right? Uh, in terms of our ability to use AI across a whole range of settings. And the key thing again, is to take human labor and management off the critical path and, draw, and allow AI to drive the decision-making and humans and labor are set up to monitor, to augment, but we drive it through the technologies themselves. Same thing happens uh, in COVID response, right? You can imagine a range of, of data around COVID that we can now build into our healthcare systems, build into our retail supply chains that can enable us to be able to be responsive and to deal with the current uncertainty as well. Now, of course, there's a lot of issues as well with this, right? I've painted a very rosy picture about the technology, but as we know, the technology also has a downside as well. The downside here, you know, includes for us 
uh, the, the, the questions about surveillance, about privacy, about bias, about con control, inclusiveness, uh, sort of amplification transparency. These questions are no longer going to be limited to the ethicists in the organization, right, or to the lawyers in the organization, but are both engineering challenges but also managerial challenges. We can't do this in the way that after we develop the technology that we talk about bias and privacy and fairness. We have to build these things right into our systems. Just like in Toyota, right, there's no quality department at the end when cars are built, right? We actually have to build quality right in. Same thing, the ethics of digital scale scope and learning are such that we need to be able to do it from the beginning, not at the end. And just as we can drive tremendous benefit with, uh, with AI and platforms and, and benefit at scale for billions of users, we also have the risk of doing bias at scale as well. And we really need to be able to control that for us. Uh, finally, again, the same thing in terms of COVID. COVID is, in fact, making these questions even more urgent because are we, as a society, going to allow for digital contact tracing at scale? What does it mean if our private actors can track every movement of ours when it comes to healthcare? And what, what does that mean for our societies this way? So again, uh, uh, we have to be thinking about these questions both from the benefit side, but also from the cost side and the ethics side along the way. And finally, so here's a call to action for you. You know, uh, this is the book. Uh, again, it came out in January, right in the middle of the COVID crisis. Uh, you know, we were running around uh, Europe uh, and then planning trips to South Asia as well around the book. Um, but, uh, but all that stopped because we also did not anticipate the exponential curve that, that COVID is. Um, but in this book, we argue about, so this transformation prerogative is for all of us, both from an economic perspective and from a social perspective. Um, you wanna drive your business and operating model of transformation and think through the virtualization of every possible operating task. Encourage strategies grounded on ubiquitous testing, true analytics and digitization. Right, engage and shape uh, sort of enlightened innovative uh, regulation. Right, uh, think carefully about privacy and security, um, and help the increasing part of the population in greater need. With that, I'm going to stop uh, and hand it back to Adi. All right, Kareem, that was uh, fantastic. And let's take a few minutes. I have a few questions for you. There's some questions that have come in uh, in the Q and A tab from the audience, and I'll try to get to a couple of those too. But first I want to, so, so you said that COVID, the COVID pandemic is accelerating the transformation to digital. Um, I want to push on that a little bit, because um, you make it sound like it's, it's, sorry, that's my dog in the background. You make it sound like it's um, almost inevitable. And I, you know, I've, I've talked to companies that, you know, obviously they're working from home, they're, they're not meeting in person, they're doing it via Zoom like this, but that's not being digital. So I want to I want to push in you in the uh, in the sense, what's the evidence that it's happening, and then maybe more practically. So a lot of companies like I don't know if we get back to normal or if the whole world has changed. So how do they think about strategy then, yes. if they need to accelerate digital transformation and they don't feel they're there? Quite great yet. question, Adi. So I mean, I think first of all, I mean, most is still too early in the crisis for us to have you know, systematic empirical evidence about the transformation, but I have lots of anecdotes uh, that we have. So, you know, I was speaking with um, the chief digital officer at Ikea. So Ikea, a large scale retail store. Uh, and uh, what Barbara Martin Coppola said was that basically once the COVID crisis hit them, all their stores were shut. There was no commerce, but e-commerce, right? And they, what they realized is that they were not set up the right way. They had basically, 15 different websites for each country with different systems, different data and so forth. In two weeks, they basically went to a common data, data store, common set of website uh, operations, and then deploying the use of algorithms to drive pricing, to drive customer choice and so forth. And the company all of a sudden realized that, that, that digital was no longer a substitute but, 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 but a real compliment to the ways they organize themselves. So Ikea, uh, you know, if you asked Barbara, she would say, you know, years of delay on digital transformation got done in two weeks and now they've accelerated that way. Again, a, an example from Verizon um, where their CIO um, has said that basically, again, they had to go to a completely touchless commerce system, both for their online stores and their offline stores. And again, they had to deploy technology at scale in order to be able to solve this problem. And I think the real question that you're asking is, uh, across a range of enterprises, the, 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 
the components of digital transformation are in place, right? We have ways to automate the ways in which we work with customers. We have ways to track and, and to deliver them with new products and services. The and because we've had no choice. The question is post vaccine, do we go back to our old ways of working, right? Or do we actually uh, embrace this new way of working and make that happen? Even at HBS, right? Uh, you know, we had this view, we still have this view that our classroom setting is sacred, right? When you come to our campus, come to Aldrich Hall, it's a beautiful experience, right? And then, uh, and by the way, I was running, I'm still running uh, an online executive program called the Harvard Business Analytics Program that we do with our engineering school. We're, re we're been teaching case method on Zoom at scale for two years. When the, our school went online, you know, if you'd asked me pre-March, how long would it take for our Harvard Business School professors to be online, digital, use all the tools available to them? I would have said decades. <laughs> and we had two weeks to train half our faculty to go online. So I think, I think what's happening is that the, the, the resistance that people had, you know, in Spanish, they say mañana, we'll do it tomorrow, we'll do it tomorrow, right? That has, they have no choice. Even our most esteemed faculty had no choice but to go and embrace this and make this work. And I've actually been surprised. People have come back to me and said, you know what? This experience was actually positive. I've learned a bunch of things and I need to change what I'm doing. But now I'm getting new sources of data, new ways of engagement. And that for me is going to change how I teach in the future. So I do see that, the, that, that, that the, anecdotally, we're seeing this transformation take place. I think the big question for executives, and I'd love to get our panel involved in this as well as we invite them to say, is, is this going to stick? Are we going to make the, the pivot or are we going to help back? I think if we hold back, I think we'll see a separation between the companies that embrace it versus those that don't. So let me take a question from the audience. I don't, I don't, I don't have a name or a, or a place attached to it, but I'll just read the question. So the, the question says the ant example is a great one. This is sort of a cheeky question, but don't you feel that a well-trained professional from HBS and places like that will always have an experiential and intuition advantage over AI? Great question. I think this is <laughs> In, the, in many ways, the biggest questions that we face, because we as human things, we're special, right? We have judgment. I can look you in the eye, Adi, right? And see what's going on in your brain and then make a judgment. But we also know that, that we're biased, we're flawed. We don't take in all the data. We have all these cognitive biases. And so I think, you know, when we do head to head comparisons in specific settings, right? Machines keep winning. Machines keep winning, right? So again, the example I gave, you know, that potential Dr. Reddy could talk about, you know, in the in uh, radiation oncology treatment, right? All of a sudden now, I can have a machine do as good a job of outlining tumors and creating a treatment plan as uh, as a, a harbor trained radiation oncologist. Right. And by the way, this machine is not going to feel, you know, on a Friday night, they'll be as effective as they are Monday morning. Right. The machine's spouse uh, won't get mad at them and that won't affect their performance. Right. So we, we privilege humans many times over for lots of things. But when we do the, the side by side comparison, right, we see the machines do better on narrow, narrow tasks. I think the question for all of us is how do these machines complement what we do and how do we re-architect our organizations to take, uh, to, to take care of these advantages instead of being in this battle of machine versus human. I think it's always gonna be a complementary story, right? And, and a, and a re-architecture story, not so much of X versus Y. So I just wanna do a quick follow-up and then we're probably out of time. But um, first of all, that was the most humble comment ever made by a Harvard Business School professor in history. So that, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, but the question of augmentation, the question about job displacement seems to me to be a matter of faith, you know, because who knows? So you either think technology will we'll solve it and, and we're ingenious and we'll find new things for humans to do, or you think machines are going to wipe out all the jobs. I, I fear that, yes, there'll be augmentation, but far fewer humans needed to do the work that machines will 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 do so much of, but I, where do where do you come down on that? I, I think I, again, I think this you know this is why I'm not a labor economist and let let those hard problems be solved by labor economists. Look, I think I think I, it's a very important question. I, I would I would take us back to history a bit to sort of think about other examples and then forecast for the future. Um, you know, when um, when photography was invented uh, in Europe, uh, it caused a crisis in the European art scene. 
because uh, the still life was the best exemplar of skill that European artists had um, uh, uh, when it came to painting and so forth. And now photography basically wiped that skill out. Um, and that caused an existential crisis in the arts community in Europe. And then that led to the birth of modernism and Picasso and, and Jackson Pollock and so on and so forth. So human beings got hit with this existential crisis, right, with this technology, and then they reinvented themselves and made that happen. The same thing is happening around AI, but it's not just in one domain, it's in all domains. Because if you sort of think about the, the prediction task or the pattern recognition task, those are abstract tasks that everybody does. And, and so now everybody is being hit with it. I think the, the, the question of displacement is, is a given. Jobs will be displaced. It's how we respond to societies around this displacement and how we do the reskilling around this and how do we actually open up the economy, right? The technologists like mine, like technology management folks, technology economists rely on growth driven by technology that we, we, we keep inventing new ways for us to do things. I think that's gonna be the matter of faith that we have to rely upon, but that doesn't mean that governments and companies don't have a responsibility to care to take care of the displacement and the rework. That needs to be done. We had that happen when the industrial revolution happened, right? When machines came in and took over farm jobs, right? Uh, textile jobs and so forth. And the same thing is gonna happen now in cognitive tasks. And I think we will have to be able to pull that off. But my, my view is that I think it's inevitable, right? Unless we're not gonna be living in a world of less data, less technology, less internet. Those things are going down that path. And you know, people often tell me, well, uh, customers' preferences will change. And they do, and the customers don't care about your prior business model, right? Go talk to Barnes and Noble and see if people really cared about buying books in a bookstore instead of buying it on Amazon, right? Customers are remorseless when new technologies become available, they provide them with new levels of convenience and service. And we as organizations and as leaders in governments and business have to account for the displacement that is actually happening, not just coming, it's happening. And then how do we respond to it? Um, Kareem, that's fantastic. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for, for taking those questions. Um, you know, my action plan for people who are interested in more, you know, buy the book, Compete in the Age of AI. Uh, I am biased as I say that, but I'm not an algorithm. So, yes. here we go. Um, so thanks, Kareem. And now, so now it's my pleasure to pivot uh, to a discussion uh, with a distinguished panel here on the challenges of becoming digital. Um, again, uh, and as Kareem has said, we all understand the imperative. We're just not sure how to get there. We're not sure if we already are, are there. Um, you know, how do we, do we, do we need to, if we don't have AI, do we need AI? How do we get it? Do we get it off the shelf? Um, so there are a lot of, a lot of questions and it's different from industry to industry. So we have a panel uh, of four experts um, with very different perspectives, all working on the ground in South Asia. So let me do the, a quick introduction and then we'll just launch right into it. So we have C, CP uh, Gornani, who's CEO and managing director of Tech Mahindra. He's helped Tech Mahindra emerge as one of India's leading digital IT solution providers. We have uh, Surajit Shom, who is the managing director and CEO of DBS Bank, leading financial services group headquartered in Singapore and active around the world. We have Dr. Sanjita Reddy, who is manager, managing director of Apollo Hospitals, one of India's foremost hospital chains, which is the claim for pioneering the private healthcare revolution in the country. And we have Abhishek Singh, the CEO of MyGov and the CEO of the National E-Governance Division of the Government of India, who is a seasoned bureaucrat in the Indian Administrative Service. So, as I said, we're gonna dive right in. So, uh, CP Gornani from Tech Mahindra, let me throw the first question to you. Um, as Kareem said, it seems like the move to digital is accelerating in the, in the, in the COVID world and should continue to do so in the post-COVID world. Um, it, do you agree with that assessment and which sectors do you think are likely to see the most profound change? What will be the next phase of dramatic digital transformation? Kareem, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Adi, for having me here with you on this panel. Uh, Kareem, uh, as soon as the session is over, I'm buying a book. Uh, there is no disagreement. I mean, uh, you should buy I, the book for everybody in your company. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> for that, I'll have to get you here first. Uh, Karim, 
uh, a Lakhani and a Gurnani can negotiate. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, the good question about this is that uh, at Tech Mahindra, we serve approximately 1,000 customers in 90 countries. And the first thing we did when COVID was a reality and around 14th of March, uh, when all of us realized that, you know, the, the best cases were that the uh, world will reopen in June, the worst case is still about talking about November. But we wanted to talk to our clients and understand what is their priority. 85%, and I have that survey report, actually came back and said, our digital plans are ready. Uh, we will be in touch with you. The same survey in middle of April started saying 90% of them said we are ready to hit the accelerate button. So the point I'm trying to make out here is that there is no argument on COVID has done what Y2K did to the Indian IT industry. Uh, COVID has made digitalization a reality in every nook and corner of the world, whether it is a neighborhood grocery store or whether it is a neighborhood, uh, you know, the, the guy who sells you uh, vegetables. I mean, everybody is taking orders digitally and delivering. So it is no longer an Amazon or a Walmart or a Flipkart who delivers to you now in India. The second part, in terms of sectors, obviously the pace of acceleration has increased. Uh, you know, uh, Kareem gave the example of Moderna. I think there are many more moderners, particularly in areas where we are directly getting impacted during COVID. Number one, healthcare. Uh, I mean, uh, I serve on a committee with Abhishek Singh, where we are looking at revamping the digital health uh, systems of India. And I promise you that we did not invent anything new. That committee was only able to aggregate nine different solutions which are already available in India and actually create a platform for being able to provide those services, whether they are called telehealth or whether they are called contact tracing. Uh, and I can go on and on. But the point again is that health is one sector which was a reluctant user has now become one of the most aggressive users of digital platforms. Similarly, education. We all have kids or we know of folks who have kids. I mean, the kids four months into a house, particularly during the summers, when it is their vacation time, I think the only word which has saved all of us is digital. So, I mean, that's an area where there is a clearly a uh, huge growth that is happening. Uh, there are almost every sector that I am aware of. For example, when I combine healthcare and people policy, we launched a product internally, uh, uh, which was basically a product which says fit to work. It had a basic dry diagnostics, one antibody diagnostics, and a lot of health related questions. And while you were answering those questions, uh, you were getting an antibody test. And people debated antibody test is not accurate, this is not perfect. And, uh, and I said, listen, as long as I know there is no infection, I don't want to be dependent only on the symptomatic part of it. Uh, and it's worked beautifully. We just saw the launch. And I personally believe that the Indian telecom system is probably the only reason four months education or healthcare or people working from home has survived. And when Geo launched today, uh, their you know multi-store digital connectivity solutions and their AGM, all I wanted to thank all the telecom companies 
that at least in India, if we are able to serve customers in 90 countries, it is because we were able to move work from home, we were able to take into account cyber security, we were able to take into account AI based digital command and control centers because people are all working from home. I don't want to compromise my customers' data. I don't want to compromise on my customers' trust. So that AI based command and control center is what has enabled Tech Mahindra to remain in business. And uh, again, repeating, Kareem, you are 100% right. There are 100 more case studies coming. And I do hope we will be contributing to those case studies. All right, TP, thank you very much. Let me move on now to Suraj Chom, who, as I said, is the CEO and Managing Director of DBS Bank. And, you know, I'd, like, I'd love to talk about sort of the broader transformation of a big company like DBS. Um, you know, as we said, as I said, it's relatively easy to launch digital products, digital channels, but transforming an organization to make it truly digital is a tougher task. Please, can you talk about the digital transformation at DBS? Thank you, Adi, and, and HVR for uh, inviting me to this distinguished panel. Really happy to be on this. So let me start by uh, saying how did we fare when COVID hit uh, us and the broader banking industry? I think that's a good starting point because, uh, as they say, uh, it was really uh, adoption at the pace of crisis. Uh, I don't think anybody was expecting to get uh, this kind of adoption. And in the case of, say, India, uh, we had lo complete lockdown in four days. And uh, in many other markets, we had similar experiences, Indonesia, other markets. And effectively, we had to deal with two broad issues. One is to make sure that we could serve our customers while still uh, being able to move as many of our employees for safety purposes to work from home. And what we experienced was that as I think Professor Lakhani said, that what was taking earlier six months, one year, two years to adopt, got adopted effectively over three, four, five, seven days. I mean, that's kind of a compression of time which you wouldn't have experienced. So it really proved a few things that organizations can do it, but can they only do it during the time of crisis? That's one question I think we have to deal with. Uh, but, but maybe uh, the other fact, that the fact that we continue to be able to serve our customers, keep our employees, almost 85, 90% of our employees, even today in India, are working from home. And we're pretty much serving 97% of all the requirements that customers have. We still can't do mortgages because registration of mortgages are not possible. But other than that, almost everything that our customers want from us, we're being able to deliver. But this is not easy. This journey has taken, I would say, seven to eight years. And I just want to quickly go back and say, what was it that uh, prompted a bank like DBS to take this massive transformation journey? And I think I want to uh, take a point from uh, Professor Lakhani's uh, uh, you know, case study of uh, Ali Pay and Ant, because effectively what banks saw seven, eight, 10 years back, that the competition was not going to come from other banks. They're going to come from obviously big tech and everybody was setting new standards of customer experience, customization, being able to personalize, and from fintechs like Ant or Ant Financial or Alibaba. This was a different paradigm. You could not compete with the tech stack that you had. You could not compete with the people that you had, or neither did, could you compete with the operating metrics that uh, you had built as a traditional banking company. So we actually took a, a three-pronged uh, transformation uh, process. I think the first one to, was really to change our tech stack. So we went from what was legacy, uh, you know, monolithic tech systems to, uh, you know, modern tech systems. So go from, uh, you know, uh, large uh, servers to pretty much uh, cloud native uh, servers and, and really microcomputing, which enabled us to then access both the, uh, the architecture of private uh, cloud, but also later on hybrid cloud. And we are now moving to multi-cloud strategy. The second was really, again, banks historically outsourced all their tech IP. We decided to insource a lot of our tech IP. So currently, we almost have 90% of our product IP, which we build ourselves, which is very similar to what big tech did. They are able to uh, react and build AI or database solutions because they control what they're building. I think that was a big part of the first, I would say, the first prong of 
uh, our view. The second was to change the way we looked at products and solutions. Banks historically were product product led, product push. So we put the customer and not just the customer, internal and external customer in our journey thinking. So thousands of journeys were run by senior people across different functions, front, front to back. Audit was running a journey on how to run audit based on data. How do you do uh, you know, uh, audit which is not annual or six monthly or three years, but based on the data that you're getting? And finally, the culture change. Again, Professor Lakhani talked about it. How do you change the culture of an organization which is very differently structured? So really our aim was to try and build a uh, 20, 28,000 startup culture, which meant you know, agile thinking, retraining our people. We took the tough task before, because we were not that large to be able to decide that we want to transform everybody. Instead of building a digital business outside our core business, we decided to transform the entire organization. And hence, it's taken us five, six years, and it's not always been easy. But what we've been able to do is to really try and get ready for what COVID has, has uh, tested us. But where do we go from here? I think the, the entire, uh, you know, I would say acceleration, which is already visible. In our view, it is a seminal moment in many industries, but definitely in the banking industry. I think customers have uh, adopted technology because they were forced to. Earlier, we would have 20, 30, 40% of different customer segments doing their business digitally. Of course, now they're forced to do 100% of their business digitally. Are they going to go back? Our view is they will not, which means that we have to further accelerate the way we serve our customers. The most important is really to try and uh, build a completely contactless uh, business model, which means you have to now start to do a more video based, you know, tomorrow AI, uh, you know, embed AI, but also be able to do AR and, I mean, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality. Can a customer be in a traditional branch, but do it sitting on their computer? I think that's coming because as 5G comes, you'll be able to get the data and the processing part to be able to give the customer the same experience that they were getting earlier. The second is, I would say, uh, being able to uh, use data, which is, again, uh, everybody is going to talk about that. But you only need a modern stack to be able to use data because historically, our data was trapped. We had lots of data. Banks sit on a wealth of data, but it's trapped. It's not in a data lake or in a structure where we can use modern tools. So the ability to move them into modern data lakes where we can then use uh, you know, AI and ML uh, availability from across the world, which is an open source, which you don't have to keep building, you can use that so you can do what Ant Financial or Alibaba is doing. And finally, I would say embed ourselves in other people's digitization. Because bank at the end of the day is a tertiary business. Other people are going to digitize at various paces, but how can we use our experience to embed ourselves in their journey? Because this digitization is now here to stay for all industries. So with that, let me uh, stop, Adi. Georgia, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, let me bring uh, Dr. Sandita Reddy in now. As I said before, she's the Joint uh, Managing Director of Apollo Hospitals. And Dr. Reddy, you know, let's talk about the medical business. We've seen the, the, the promise and the limitations, I'd say, of digital processes during the COVID crisis. You know, what's next? How do you see digital uh, initiatives transforming the healthcare business, particularly in South Asia? Avi, once again, thank you and thank you, HBS. It's a pleasure to be with uh, so many people and so many industries who are using AI in these fantastic ways. I think that healthcare is probably one of the most powerful recipients of technology and one that needs it the most. And clearly, COVID has been the digital accelerant of the decade for us. Uh, if you look at some of the things that we're doing across our health ecosystem, to begin with, we actually had telemedicine. We started telemedicine way back in 2020. I mean, in, tw in 2000. And today in 2020, 20 years from there, is when we're seeing this massive inflection point. Earlier, we probably did about two to 300 teleconsults a day. Today, we're doing more than 10,000 teleconsults a day. So this inflection point, which has come over the last three, four months, has been amazing. And then I think it's enabled us to get close to the customer because even a teleconsult is a one-to-one -one of a consumer with a doctor. Uh, the, the technology, the telecom are all enabling, uh, so to say, the distance that they don't have to leave their home. 
But when you look at AI and the way you can use the knowledge of clinicians to treat patients, to care for patients, to triage patients better, then the scale of impact becomes many, many times more. So, for example, our AI-enabled digital health scan for COVID. We did in the last four months, over 18 million people took that digital health scan. If I think of trying to connect with 18 million people without an AI tool, the massive scale of manpower required to do it and the ability to do quality assurance and have a unified methodology would have been humongous, unimaginable. But with AI, we could. Then you move on to virtual care models, which go beyond uh, a doctor to a patient to actually be what, what is called in the industry as B2B. So virtual care, where our EICU module, uh, where you have centralized monitoring, these monitors, sensors, and the entire internet of medical things, creating a connected ecosystem so your doctor or your health system need not physically be there. We are today connected with over uh, 7,000 ICU beds, which are not within an Apollo hospital. That was transformational. And then you look at scale and the scalability. So while we have across our ecosystem about 3,000, 2,650 beds dedicated to COVID, we partnered with hotel infrastructure or rooms to create what we call stay I, which is stay isolated. But what changed them from just a hotel room is a medically supervised room using telemedicine with a connectivity with the patient's own smartphone. So you did one physical round with a doctor or a nurse using a mobile system, but then all day long, the patient stayed connected or the healthy individual who had the potential to become sick was connected using his own phone into our platform, which was web enabled, which had the capability to connect. So what we, I think, is the critical aspect is finding the appropriate use case and applying it in a manner which has the patient or the healthy individual in the center, which very much engages the doctor so that the doctor's capability, knowledge, intelligence is embedded into the system. And it's very clear that these systems are not replacing doctors. They're empowering doctors to treat more, to care more, to be available more. And therefore, that becomes the transformational aspect of adoption. I also want to state that in the field of education in healthcare, for COVID, in the last you know, four months, we have updated our care protocol 23 times, taking information from the, say, the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, looking at papers and publications, which are coming out at the rate of almost 22 papers per day taking that knowledge and then disseminating it over our ecosystem and our doctors who are treating and caring. So that's over 5,000 clinicians. So the ability to do that kind of education and then go outside of our education system, the basic COVID training program that we created was taken, the course of seven hours was taken by over 170,000 people. But then we went further, the ventilator training program uh, that was done by about 42,000 people where we gave knowledge. We created a simulated environment so they could say, okay, patient, 56 years old, oxygen requirement so much. What are the knobs and the buttons? How do you create the right settings? And then went one step further to say the Indian Association of Critical Care Medicine did a buddy system for the first time users of ventilators to say, don't worry, we may not be physically next to you but you can call us. So a 24 by 7 support system. This virtual care embedded with learning could be transformational in a crisis where we were flying the plane and repairing the plane and redesigning the plane all at the same time. And that's where I think organizations who understood what is technology need had some of these platforms already ready, were positioned with the right partners and then had created an appreciation within their own healthcare ecosystem or their teams or their manpower or, or women power. They were the ones who were able to use these tools in the most effective manner in the short term. And I think powerful partnerships. I must mention that uh, 
the cardiac risk score which we did with microsoft was one of the seminal things that we did to understand how to clean up our data get the data into the the data lake make it create semantic interoperability and standards based documentation and when you do some of those things then your ability to create care algorithms which are embedded into the ai and then embedded into the daily practice of work and then empowered by chatbots to connect with individuals whether they are patients or uh, or healthcare workers all this is is multiplied in a in a completely you know leading a manner and that is something some this ability to achieve scale with replicability and quality is something that the healthcare system needs more than anything because all of you know that we have a shortage of manpower or women power all of you know that there is pockets of knowledge which is not disseminated across the ecosystem and each one of these is something that is uh, tremendous for us i think the next aspect that we should talk about is really how do we you know enable home care so healthcare actually is moving from the hospital to the clinic from the clinic to the home and from the home to a 24 by 7 ubiquitous access to care enabled by your mobile phone individuals who are not i mean healthy individuals are now becoming care experts so there's knowledge and content uh, there's a huge aspect of compliance because as as much as covid is top of mind the true pandemic in the world is non communicable disease and non communicable disease are primarily driven by lifestyle and change in lifestyle doesn't happen by a 5 minute interaction with a doctor or by popping a pill or by a surgery it happens by a continuous ecosystem of connectivity with your healthcare provider your doctor your nutritionist maybe your yoga therapist it happens by reminders by becoming a part of your daily life and that's what technology is enabling i also think another major aspect in this is that all the players and providers so if we find ways to come together then we break the silos of knowledge and the silos of care provisioning into building a continuum of care which encompasses the patient or the healthy individual and uh, we have examples of that happening in our country uh, the government is moving in terms of a digital platform uh the government created a telemedicine bill in india which has enabled us to do more many of us of private providers has come together with the blessing of the government to create a multi player multi centric care platform where you can find a doctor teleconsult book your medicines uh book your tests and i think the data which flows into that will help us move into the digital era of disease surveillance disease registries and all these are win win environments for simply better care better supervision healthier people and healthier individuals and a quality health system so okay. i'm excited i'm excited about the future uh, i think uh, covid has been an accelerator and many many of these transformations are going to stick patients right. who consulted with their doctors in a non in the current covid area are going to ask why do i have to come into your clinic why can't you call me at home yeah. so many of these are going to stick and uh, i'm i'm just excited about the possibilities of the future okay, dr reddy that that's fantastic and and very inspiring um i want to bring in our last panelist and and dr reddy you've teed up some of the 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 questions about the government but this is abhishek singh who's the ceo of mygov and you know the us where i come from we think of technological solutions is coming from private enterprise but you know that's not necessarily the case elsewhere and I'd, i'd love to know your thoughts on what the government of india can do about accelerating digital you know and what what role can governments generally play to enable a digital ecosystem that can fuel innovation thank you thank you and it was uh, thank you adi and it was indeed great listening to the uh, to cp to surajit and dr sangeeta and they have given great insights into the into what what needs to be done how it needs how it can be done so with regard to government and how it can enable uh, the process of going digital the prime focus of the government remains that how do we improve services which citizens are looking for the government and what technology does is that it helps fast forward that it helps accelerate that in order to ensure that 
we are able to reach out to the last mile. India, for example, if you look at India, when we started our digital journey, we realized that we are a big country, we are diverse, there are poor areas which do not have connectivity, and there are multiple languages. So using that, government thought that one way to bridge distance and one way to transcend languages and will be to go digital and to build platforms which can help us build services on top of that. In the last few years, we built several such solutions, whether it's identity-based solution, the largest identity platform of UID, with the largest payment platforms of UPI, which helped enable direct benefit transfers. And all these initiatives have come to us at good rescue when we face a crisis like uh, COVID-19. When we look at that, the kind of ecosystem that we existed, like one of the crises that we faced just after the pandemic was that, how do we enable help to the poor and the needy in the rural areas? And within no time, within a couple of days, we were able to transfer billions of dollars in the bank accounts of people, and they were able to access the funds even in the lockdown and by going to the common service centers, which are like a banks within, the, within a kilometer of where they live. So we have a network around 400,000 common service centers, which are digitally enabled telecenters, which offer public services and private services. So this was possible because the investments India made in technology, the government made in technology over the last uh, several years. When we look at uh, our response, the, one of the biggest challenges that came with COVID was that how do we communicate uh, terms like quarantine, terms like uh, uh, social distancing? Because these are not part of our lexicon. So the biggest challenge became how do we let people know that this is what it means. And then the uh, associated behavioral change, because uh, we India realized very early that till a vaccine comes or till a drug comes, only way to restrict the spread of the virus will be to communicate uh, behavioral changes with regard to use of masks or use of social distancing or use of better hygiene practices. And all of this was communicated through a huge communication exercise that MyGov ran in association with the Ministry of Health. And we started communicating in various languages, making videos, making infographics, communicating these ways right to the last mile. And when we did that, we started also using AI-based chatbots. People, people would not come to our portals or download our app, but they would use uh, channels like WhatsApp, Telegram, Facebook, uh, Instagram. So we start, we built AI-based chatbot on WhatsApp, we based uh, on our portal, and wherein people could query things and get replies back. When we faced the crisis during the lockdown, a lot of migrants were going back to their places. It was one of the largest migration exercise India has had uh, handled in the last few years. So technology again played a big role. So what we did was that uh, the entire movement plan with regard to trains, with regard to how they will move from one place to the other, how the testing will be done, that was enabled by, by using technology. The shelter homes, the feeding centers that will put, they put on maps and NGOs and all associated in doing that. The other big challenge that we found we faced during this whole thing, where again technology played a big role, was that uh, managing work from home. Because India has one of the long, longest lockdowns across the world, which helped us uh, control the pandemic to a great extent. And during this, not only the private businesses, but the government offices also were moved from a work from home uh, regime. So this required uh, this required a quick migration, giving tools, or video conferencing solutions, VPN tools for people to work, and quickly it was adopted and uh, enabled for everyone. Then uh, e-learning became a big focus with regard to how do we ensure that which students get class attend to the classes. E-learning tools are there. Then uh, how do we enable telemedicine? And as uh, Dr. Sangeeta was mentioning, and uh, CP has been a part of our team, wherein we work day and night to ensure that uh, a telehealth platform is uh, enabled and which is able to offer people help when they need uh, they need. And then uh, with the help of industry and with the help of startups and with the help of best, best of tech engineers, we also came up with an app, with a contact tracing app, Aroge Setu, which has got more than 150 million uh, users till date. And the way the data which was coming from this app the way it has helped in predicting emerging hotspots by use of large-scale data analytics and working on which are the areas which might have more number of cases in a few days from now. So using that, we were able to predict hotspots. We were able to give it to the health authorities. We were able to give it to uh, administration and containment measures were done. So that is one of the reasons because of which even though today we are the third largest country with regard to number of cases that we have, but if you look at the number of deaths, we are the one of the lowest. In fact, we have 17.2 deaths per million of population against 
73 worldwide. Or the number of cases also we have 650 odd against the global average of 1638. So there have been measures taken with regard to communications, with regard to use of technology, with regard to extending help. Then again, even with apps and all, we found that we have a large number of people who do not have smartphones. So how do we address their challenges? So for them, we came up with a solution of, uh, of a, a 1921 uh, IVRS line wherein people could call from a non, or from a feature phone or a basic phone and they could get a call back and they could go through a basic uh, health checkup on that. So all this really helped us in, uh, in uh, addressing the challenge that we have by use of technology. Of course, the issues of digital divide remain. How do we ensure the poor people also are able to access e-learning? How do we ensure that uh, issues of mental health when people are not meeting each other and all are at risk? But we are working with, uh, with several partners in order to address that uh, those issues also. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I, if the panelists are willing to, to stay on for a few more minutes, um, we're, we're technically kind of at our limit, but, but I'd love to be able to ask a couple of questions that sort of amalgamate some of the questions that have come in from our audience. So if, if people have a few more minutes, uh, I think the first is is sort of the human element of all this. And, and CP, maybe I'll start with you and if anyone else wants to jump in. But really the question of, OK, you 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 proclaim that you're digital, you uh, you adopt a digital strategy. So what about upskilling your talent? I mean, what 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 can you say um, from experience about, you know, the right way to do that? Does everyone come along for the ride? Is everyone upskillable? You know, what, what have you learned in the process? Adi, uh, you know, really, when I look at upskilling, I mean, I agree with Kareem that displacement of jobs is a reality. The question is, can we plan for the future? Do we have a strategy for the future? So on one part, we do the visioning. And obviously, we look at the skills that are required for the future. Uh, no real big guesses, AI, IoT, cybersecurity, augmented reality, 5G, or quant computing. Now, these are the skills which are definitely required in the technology domain. The second part that we emphasize is that uh, the responsibility of upskilling is no longer only limited to the corporate. I think what we have tried to do is uh, where the corporate has taken responsibility is to tie up with academia, uh, create a future scenarios, and educate the people. We have 125,000 employees, but we reversed the pyramid. And we said, you now own your own career. You are the brand, and you need to be relevant. And that's worked like magic because people, uh, when they are empowered, uh, they do a very, very phenomenal job and they take the best out of us, best out of the classrooms and best out of the academia. So I think upskilling is clearly a focus area, but more important also is to take into account that the world of COVID-19 also means learning critical thinking and alternate thinking. That a gym cannot remain out of business and if you can rediscover yourself to become a digital platform, a resort cannot close down forever and it can become a vacation instead of a vacation a destination. Or what Sangeeta was talking, that a health platform need not be the same old hospital where you took an appointment with a doctor and you had X number of beds and, you know, you managed your inventory. I think what I learned from Sangeeta was that an Airbnb model or an asset light model can also be applied to a hospital. So I think as long as we can focus on being relevant, uh, uh, focus on alternate and critical thinking. And last but not the least, I mean, average age of my company is 29. When I reverse the pyramid, I actually also have reverse mentoring for my senior leaders. 
because that reverse mentoring is equal to my creating a right environment for 2025 so complex subject but i can promise you uh, empower people it works that's great um karim anything to add to that this is the the, the talent question uh you know can everyone make it how do we ensure that 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 most people make it and and how do we how do we really impart these skills to make our companies truly digital yeah look i think i think my my sense is that the the training prerogative is with the with the firms and with governments uh i think the as an educator i think everybody can be trained <laughs> uh but i think i really think um uh the the, the a key element to consider is how do we enable so the entrepreneurial opportunities to show up both inside the organizations and outside how do we create a culture that given these skills so you know if you sort of think about the dbs bank example they'll need a lot more ml ai folks digitization folks they may have to rethink what the teller organization looks like um and and so then what happens to those talent those people that get retrained do they have opportunities elsewhere can we promote them to go elsewhere i think that's going to be the critical part of the entrepreneurial opportunities or finding creative ways to take the talent and and show them other pathways uh for success i think that's going to be the key out for us dr ardi i i, I want to follow up with you um you know i think of doctors at least in the us as you know almost being like cowboys they sort of surgeons especially but they they kind of do things their own way and you know aren't particularly interested in management processes and you know i'm imagining would be initially resistant to any of these transformations that aren't the way things have already been done or that disempower them in some way talk about you know the extent to which um the profession has turned out to be amenable to some of the transformations that you're talking about uh i would uh, completely agree with you in one way that doctors are individualistic but that is tied up with their high uh, intelligence quotient and their ability to really transform an individual's life but when a scenario like covid came in and they knew that their patients could not reach them because of the lockdown they said if digital is the way to connect then we're on and it hardly needed any training i mean uh, the language i think in the platform in india especially is omni channel so you use every possible medium multi language and simple and once you've done that then your adoption is quite tremendous and quite phenomenal so of course uh, let me just say that very simply we were analyzing yesterday and we found an 89% adoption rate in our doctors to one or four of the one to four of the platform options that we gave them whether it was virtual care teleconsult put your data on the chatbot uh, enable a follow up and protocol of care through the personal health record so each one of these they started adopting so i just want to say that when it's when it solves a problem when the environment gives a need when it's friendly for their patients then doctors will be amenable Um great Serge let me pose a question your way so you've been part of a transformation uh within a big company um I, I guess I have a couple of questions that might be useful for our audience um and and the first it's sort of a two part question the first is how do you um how do you get to that point strategically where you're able to sort of see the future understand you need to disrupt yourself disrupt your processes and do something entirely different not the same thing digitally but probably something entirely different and then as you launch that path what are the metrics the measurements along the way that make you feel like okay we're on the path we're becoming digital can you talk about that a little bit from the dbs perspective sure uh so the first one uh in terms of uh i maybe take the second question first Uh, you know when you look at uh, the challenges of uh, getting to uh, becoming digital and, and the point you made is is the uh, the initial uh, aim or 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 tendency is to digitize parts which are easy to digitize it always uh, is uh, the preference because people want to do uh, that quickly and and get early runs on the board but it is really to take every process end to end 
and look to digitize the entire process. And that is a lot more challenging because there are a lot more issues when you want to uh, do digitization end to end, because then firstly, you have to think journey thinking, which means you need to understand what are the issues, but then you need to digitize because if you have uh, you know, issues around a process where there are blocks which are still manual or old stack, then the digitization at one end of the process really doesn't give you scale. So I think that's one of the uh, uh, bigger ch challenges. But the other issue on, on you know, the, the strategic question, I think the strategic question for banking industry eight, 10 years back was what was the big threat? And I think sometimes threat uh, poses the biggest uh, strategic imperative. And when we looked at what was happening where, where big tech was, and, in, and especially, especially in the case of uh, what was happening in China, which was probably one of the earliest adopters, the AI ML at scale, it was very clear that the innovation was coming from outside the banking industry. And you could not do band-aid uh, uh, digitization to compete in that space. You needed to do inside out change of the company to go from being a bank which digitizes to become a technology company in your mindset and your processes and your people to be able to offer good financial services or great financial services and that's the competition we saw seven eight years ten years back from uh, the fintech companies or even big tech which at that time was threatening to get in now you have the google pays of the world which are firmly inside uh, the the mainstream financial services payment space so i think that's I would say the big imperative is when you see the uh, big threat and some people saw it and made the change. Others thought that, you know, they'll never be able to enter or the protection that regulators provided for a longer period was kind of a period where, where people were lulled into staying the course of the old model. That's all I would say. Yeah. All right. So we have time for one last question and I will pose that to Abhishek Singh. Um, so representing the government here, uh, you know, a number of questions have come in about uh, cybersecurity, data security, um, you know, even related to the decision uh, pulling Chinese apps from, from the Indian market. Um, so the question maybe is, you know, how, how safe is, you know, the new age of digital India where approximately 70% of the population by some estimates, are digitally illiterate. How do you, how do you think about cybersecurity, data security, as we're on this digital revolution? See, as we go digital, the challenges from cybersecurity goes up. It happens in all parts of the country, all, all parts of the world, but in India, all the more so, for the reason that you mentioned, many people might not be aware of what are the best practices with regard to protecting your device or protecting your phone or not sharing your OTPs or not sharing your passwords or not sharing your CVVs. And when we do a lot of financial transactions, these things become very important. And the related issues are with regard to privacy, the privacy issues with regard to protecting the personal data, with regard to what kind of permissions that you give when you're using a tech solution or an app. So very often people need to be educated, need to be aler alerted about this. So we have a robust uh, cyber security system. We have a, uh, the Center for Cyber Security, the CERT in the India's nodal agency, which monitors all this. We have been like, uh, since the COVID times, uh, the phishing attacks, the cyber attacks on Indian systems had really gone up from, uh, we all know from which the country which lead cyber attacks world over. And then there was an audit done with regard to which are the apps which are indulging in behavior or trying to get data, which is, beyond what is required for the functionality that they offer. And based on that, there was a report from the cybersecurity division with regard to certain breaches that were observed. So some 59 apps were banned, were blocked from access. And there is a process which is going into looking into the violations that they did. And at the same time, we also tried to kickstart the Indian app ecosystem because we have tech entrepreneurs who have built the, who are leading the top tech companies across the world. And they are company, they are tech entrepreneurs who are building world-class solutions within India. So we have come up with a policy for promoting uh, solutions, which can be, which are secure, which are safe, which are stored in India, do not compromise say data and security of individuals as also of government systems. So that is the way it's being handled. One way is to making systems secure. And the other way is to, have a communication plan to make people aware with regard to uh, the best practices regard to ensuring that their data and their phones and their uh, devices are safe. So this is all that we are doing for cybersecurity. All right, that's fantastic. So 
Um, I want to thank uh, our speaker and our panelists and everyone who has joined us for a really interesting session. I, I, I'm going to not do a lot of wrapping up because we, we've we've gone on too long, but you know, clearly the pandemic has been an inflection point. Um, I think everyone agrees that um, we've been able to do what would have been unthinkable in uh, an incredibly fast amount of time. You know, I find that inspiring to think about what else can we do that, uh, what other problems can we solve that we thought were intractable? What other things can we do that, that we had would have thought could not have been done? So it's, it's a very interesting period. Uh, for all of us, we're living through an amazing historical period. So uh, I want to thank Karim Lakhani, C.P. Gurnani, Surajit Chom, Sanjeet Reddy, and Abhishek Singh for uh, really great presentations, and thank everyone for watching. Stay tuned for um, information on uh, future, future events in this series, and uh, thank you all, and have a good evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate it. Namaste.